In August of 1915, and they took them. They said they were going to take them to the army. Instead, they have taken them out in the field and shot them. Our Armenian people rebelled. They cried. They started complaining about the army, to the Turks about it. Of course, no one listened to them. We were not allowed out at night anymore. We were not allowed to go out in the field and play. She grabbed the baby and ran into the river. She wanted to throw herself, but they, somebody caught her. They brought her back. Then our city was full of gendarmes, which Turkish soldiers. They chased everybody in their homes. They beat many of them. They robbed many of them. They tied my grandmother onto a horse with a rope, and they dragged her miles and miles around, or to make her example to all the other villagers so they will not destroy the harvest, the wheat, barley, oats, hay, livestock, could be left to the Turks. When my grandparents came to the United States, they came to, um, they met actually in Niagara Falls and got married. And, and uh, my grandfather owned this restaurant that became very well known, Louis. And so that I like a lot. Uh, I remember that this part right here is like a, a closet area that was, we had asked they had asked us to about special places that we had in our house when we were little. 
And I used to go into my closet with and read a book with my flashlight and whatever. So that's kind of the idea there. Um, the Statue of Liberty is an icon that's important and stands out as an important story from my um, grandmother retelling how she came to America. And so that's this kind of symbol here, and I love what you did with that. Um, and then this yellow is actually um, representative of a banana. <laughs> and um, I, it was uh, the question, I think, that you had asked was um, about heroes or yeah, something. Who was your, uh, yeah, who was and, everybody was a hero. And Jane Goodall was um, on my list of many. But she is a big standout for me growing up, and so the banana kind of is a good symbol for that. Uh, number four is an expression. Do we write it now? No, no, draw it. You mean like an emotion? Yeah, yeah, happy oh, a fish? Oh. I thought you meant like yeah. trying oh, to figure out how to draw oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> a facial expression. What brought this story out was that I was drawing my grandmother's bracelet, and um, there were these little discs that linked all together and made this chain, and she always wore it. And um, the little discs were actually ac little octagonals, kind of like a honeycomb. And that reminded me that um, my, my, um, her family name was Alexanian, and that was a very, um, how I understand it, was a very well-known name to uh, the Turks, and it was on the A list of families um, that they were looking for and would like to remove. There were a number of um, leaders in the Alexanian family that were um, that opposed what was going on, and so they were they were sought out. And so my grandfather told my or my great grandfather told his family that they would no longer be Alexanians, they would be Bolemians. So um, Bolemian means beekeeper, and um, then you link back to the octagonal shapes in my grandmother's bracelet. So that was an aha, uh -huh, that was kind of cool. And then um, the idea that we were talking about with the torch was that perhaps in order to gain their freedom, Rather than a flame, it was actually a bee, one of those things, those bee keeps as a symbol instead of the flame. And that maybe that could be... Statue of Liberty's hand with a beehive on it. You know, holding that up instead of the torch. So that's okay. the idea that came out. And, and she wants to do this, and we're going to do it through Photoshop with photographs, not by drawing. We're going to put a beehive onto the little Statue of Liberty's torch. Different families come at it in different ways. Some families talked a lot about it. Some families didn't talk at all about it. And families that were survivors, I mean, typically did not know the big picture of what happened. They knew bits and pieces of what happened to their own family as it was told to them. But it's not like you can start from saying, well, there was this plan, and then the plan was carried out in the following way, and then you sort of tell it top down. It's more like if you try to tell it from the grassroots up, you have a certain person's experience, which has to do with, you know, we went here, we went there, there was, you know, terrible things happened, we survived somehow, but it's all sort of chaotic because it was a chaotic experience to be in, mm -hmm. you know. And then you have the effort of, translating and communicating all of that to maybe somebody who can be a sympathetic audience but has no idea of the background and then if you're removed about three generations you don't really know how to reconstruct it either so it's more like telling somebody else's nightmare <laughs> it's not necessarily a rational process and even the scholars let me tell you when I talk to a lot of scholars about this even the scholars are not always clear because new sources are always coming out about this mm. It's, you know, they're still reconstructing the story 
depending on whose point of view it is. Is it, you know, the survivor point of view? Is it an American missionary point of view? Is it a Turkish point of view? Which Turkish point of view? Austria, Hungary, Germany, diplomats, missionaries. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that story is still being told at the macro level, so we have here at the micro level, at the individual level. No wonder we're confused. <laughs> because of all the sexual violence. Exactly. But the women, especially, were not going to talk about that. And, mm -hmm. and it just, yeah. And so it, it really did take time for the stories to come down. What... Not the shaming part, but the rest of it, the, the importance of remembering, because the person who had lived through it, because my, you know, it was my great grandparents, and, and we didn't get those stories as directly mm -hmm. as you did. It, it didn't, it took a generation to, to start to percolate down. I almost always wear an, an evil eye. That's another thing that is just, I don't what know. What is an evil eye? It's to ward, the idea is that it absorbs evil away from the wearer. So it protects, you know, cars, whatever, anything that's valuable to you. You should draw what it looks like. Yeah. Well, so there's, distinctive. there's so many of them, and, you know, they're not just for Armenians. I saw yeah. them all over Istanbul. They're that's for everywhere, sure. but everywhere. Is there, is there a conflict between evil eye and Christianity? Well, it's, it's superstition. <laughs> it's a pagan okay. belief. But like I, we had a really good friend of the family who who was religious, and she had them together. But if oh. the priest was there, she'd take the eye <laughs> and like put it under her shirt and leave the cross. <laughs> but you can buy crosses with an evil eye in the middle. Seriously? I mean, yes. Seriously? Yes, they make them. I mean, I'm not you shocked. can't buy them Shocked's from the you. church, <laughs> but you just can't separate people from their belief. I mean, you just you can't legislate that people, you know. Number two is a, a monument. That's it? Yeah. I told you, they're not sentences. Yeah, but this is, this is a hard one to not be... <laughs> a monument. Forcefully thinking. <laughs> Whatever comes to your mind first. One of my uh, friends who I've known since uh, 1971, he comes in, he's not part of the team, but he comes in and makes moves on all my paintings. <laughs> People don't know about him. <laughs> uh, but his name appears in the catalogs and stuff, so it doesn't matter. And he came in here and he said, uh, you know, he saw that these things were part of the monument and it was over. He says, let's put some in front of it. You know, but, if you, but when we decided to put them in front, it would block off stuff. So he says, let's make this as a symbol of these things. So you feel like it's around. Those are, the red ones are in the back, yeah. the blue ones. And so that was his idea to put those in. And he goes, do you have anything I can draw with? And so I handed him the blue tape. <laughs> <laughs> so he started to draw with the blue tape. And then he put them in, and they looked terrible. And then, um, <laughs> uh, and then I went over, and I started to, you know, I didn't have the idea. But once I saw his idea, my eyes lit up, and then I started to manipulate until together we got him into these positions. And then we were going to figure what color should we make them. And the blue tape looked so good, we just matched the blue tape's color. The, the, the circles are, I mean, the, the pit where the flame is, is like, I think it's in, there's a flame, and then there's like a separation area, and then there's like a, there's just a, like, a, like almost like a, like almost like a subway platform. That's how, you know, yes. so there it is. The so, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. like yeah. a kind of a moat. That's it. Right. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. so this point right here, right how high would it be? It was uh, my dad, the one story my dad told about his, the, his mother told him was when they were, um, her father was being taken away and the whole village was coming apart. And so the women were going one way and the men were all going another way. And she went to go kiss her father and she spit a cherry into his mouth. Because like that's they were taking they were being taken away. It's like the last thing he's going to eat, you know. Because they realized they were all going to get taken away to get killed. And I can just, it's this odd image of a you know daughter going to her father and kissing and literally spitting a, a cherry into his mouth as if to say you know it's our last. That was a very odd symbol, but it's weird. Like, you know. Are there, any, are there any photographs that you have? I have that photograph. Let's, can you scan that and send it to us? And they're in front of a tree? Well, they're in front of this house, and it's, it's, the, it's the one image of all, the, all of her kids, all, the, all of her five kids and all of her grandkids. And that was, um, that was the last photo of her with all of them, but wow. See, my dad 
he would tell the story, he would get upset. Or, or, you know, there's that whole thing that came up for me, and then there was just like the ultimate generosity when you have nothing and you give that last one thing and you risk a lot by giving it because in my mind how my grandmother described it they just kind of lined them up and the soldiers had a tremendous number of weapons or whatever I mean there were and um, you know you do one thing wrong and you know you're expended and so oh. that all wrapped up into that one little action is really powerful but there were protesters in the street uh, throwing eggs and tomatoes and carrying scary signs and that kind of stuff against the fact against that the conference against to. the people in the conference so that was 2005 so when I went you know I was ready for anything I had no idea I had no idea how it was going to go but it was almost anticlimactic the fact that they could do it so yeah but see, 2005 was before Herant Dink was murdered, and it was before the big 100,000 person demonstration. So, it was before a lot of things happened, so. They don't want to set off a spark again. Well, I guess. Um, yeah, there, there could be a lot of reasons. Like, what? That couldn't have possibly happened. That's, they're making that up. But, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I think, I don't think they could put it in perspective. I mean, with all of the other burdens of trying to, I mean, right away trying to um, create a whole new community in a foreign land and then try to feel like you're, you know, you're wearing a badge of courage or whatever. I don't think, I think they were just in survival mode and post-traumatic stress, shame, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff. There weren't a lot of therapies or anything for someone else to explain that it was normal or... I mean, they just kind of had to make their way. Plus, it was like my great-grandparents were the ones who came over, and it was the Depression. They were raising three kids during the Depression. So, again, yeah. just survival. They just worked themselves to the bone every day. Plus, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a time in American history where people would talk about such personal things. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not so much emphasis on self-disclosure like we're doing right now, right? right. Yeah. right. This kind of self-disclosure mm -hmm. right here in front of a camera where we don't know where it's going is so against Armenian culture. Armenian culture. I can't tell you. It really is, especially talking about this kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable. Don't you, don't you find that yeah. uncomfortable? I really do. Mm -hmm. I really do. I just feel guilty because yeah. it's so many generations removed. I mean, who am I to talk about? You know, it's like I have the luxury of talking yeah, about else, it now. Who else is going right. to talk about yeah. it? Who else is left? You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, but but I but I also agree that um, to have enough emotional distance to talk about it to grandchildren, I think, is much easier, and they weren't in survival mode anymore. And and also with grandchildren, maybe it's less of a burden for the grandchildren to hear it. And the grandchildren are also growing up at a different time where there's a framework for hearing this sort of thing. There's a way to process it. You can process it as a, you know, wow, look what my grandmother lived through and she survived. You know, the whole heroic thing. Uh, the civil rights movement had happened. Um, ethnic pride had happened for a lot of groups. There's, I mean, there's so much more that made it possible for there to, for there to be an opening. And... Um, and what else? I mean, after 1965, that was the 50th anniversary of the genocide. Armenians all over the world came out of the closet about the genocide. Okay? But before that, you know, I mean, it was as though the culture was dead, memory was dead, and it, and, and it was a good thing that memory was dead because why relive it? What were you going to do about it? So a lot of things had to happen before that could be ready.